Welcome back to the Fight Society Podcast. I am Damon Martin. we got a great show today. We're going to be talking to the main event fighter from UFC on Portland this week, and we're going to welcome into the show John Dodson, and also on the show today, the middleweight champion of the world. He faces Dan Henderson next Saturday night in England. Michael the Count Bisping joins us here in just a little bit. Obviously, the big news of the day, however, is UFC 205. The card is finally finalized after a lot of speculation and a lot of rumors about what was going to be going on, who was going to be fighting, what was going to be the main event. We now know it will be Conor McGregor versus Eddie Alvarez for the UFC lightweight title. We also have Tyron Woodley taking on Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, as well as Joanna Jacek taking on Karolina Kowalkowicz. What an incredible card. Three title fights. I mean, when you look down the card, I mean, Chris Weidman and Yoel Romero is probably going to be the fourth fight down. You got Donald Cowboy Cerrone and Kelvin Gastelum. You got Misha Tate and Raquel Pennington. You got Frankie Edgar and Jeremy Stevens. I mean, this card, Khabib Nurmagomedov is fighting, Jer- is fighting uh, Michael Johnson. I mean, this is ridiculous. This is a 10-fight main card easily. You could easily do a 10-fight main card. Ridiculous. It's absolutely Ridiculous. Now, obviously, you know, on paper, I mean, listen, on paper, a lot of things can change. I was at UFC 200. I know how that works. Uh, When you get a call on a Wednesday night or whatever saying you might want to come out to the MGM Grand and you find out John Jones is out three days before the fight, it tends to throw a monkey wrench into things a little bit. So my excitement is obviously, you know, on on a whole other level. I mean, three title fights. It's a Conor McGregor show, which is always insane. Obviously, some other great fights on there. I mean, the Weidman Romero fight should be fantastic. Um, the the Tate Pennington fight. I'm really looking forward to that one. Uh, Edgar Stevens should be really good. Uh, Khabib and Michael Johnson, man, I love that fight. So yeah, it's just nonstop. I mean, it's just nonstop. And there's not a bad fight on this card. There's literally not a bad fight on this card. Um, Obviously, it all came together yesterday at the UFC 205 pre-fight press conference, and I packaged together some of my favorite bits from the press conference to play for you here. Uh, you know, Conor McGregor, again, when Conor McGregor is doing a press conference, it, it does become the Conor McGregor show. You do kind of feel bad for some of the other fighters up there because you know he's going to end up answering the bulk of the questions. Right or wrong, that's what's going to happen. I mean, Boreal Romero sat up there and did nothing yesterday. You feel kind of bad for the guy. He flies all the way to New York, puts on his Sunday best, and uh, and then he sits up there for basically 45 minutes and doesn't say a word. You kind of feel bad for the guy for that. Uh, but that's what happens when Conor's on stage. He attracts such he, he attracts and demands such a huge audience that everything else kind of falls by the wayside. I mean, most of the fighters up there asked, you know, got asked maybe one or two questions at most, uh, you know, outside of Connor and obviously Eddie Alvarez. And, you know, and, and you know, a couple of things went to Tyron Woodley. I think Stephen Thompson had one question. That's just how it goes. You almost you, you almost kind of feel bad for the other guys up there because Connor does demand such attention, and, and I get it. He's a soundbite machine. So I, I, I put together a compilation of a couple of my favorite moments from the UFC 205 press conference right now. Uh, this is Connor McGregor. This is Connor McGregor show. So you know, the, the Connor talking about Eddie, talking about titles, talking about Jose Aldo. Let's listen in. He got it done by signing his last contract. He didn't even negotiate new money for himself. Imagine that. Look at everybody up here. They're all dressed like me. They're all trying to talk like me. They're all trying to be me. Everyone in the game wants this fight. This is the lottery fight. And this man took it on his last contract. Imagine that. Imagine getting the biggest fight in the history of the game and saying, shut your mouth, kid. You're getting paid what you got your last fight. And you're lucky you're even getting that. Yes, sir. And sign it. That's what happened. You done yet? You done yet? Hey, I, I was, I was, I was okay with the money. I wasn't gonna, I was gonna negotiate the money. Because this guy's easy, it's easy money, easy money, easy. I'm gonna wrap one on one shoulder. I'm gonna wrap the other on the other shoulder. And you're gonna need a fucking army to come take them belts off me. They're gonna, they're gonna have to gather an army to try and take one of them off me, and that's how straight. And one's gonna be there, one's gonna be there. I'm gonna be picking and choosing who I want to destroy next, and that's it. Would you fight Aldo again? Let's see what happens with Aldo. I mean, it's hard to even think of, of Aldo. I KO'd him in 13 seconds. I traveled around the world with him. He pulled out on two weeks' notice. If Frankie was good enough and he had to came through that last one, it would have been me, me and Frankie in the, for, the, for the featherweight belt here. He just wasn't up to scratch. So, 
I'm gonna let that featherweight division play out, see how it goes, but I'm the featherweight world champion. Now in November, I'm gonna be the lightweight world champion, and I'm gonna hold two of them consecutively. Not a shot. That's it. Not a shot. You ain't got a shot. Right here. Right here, the hardest hitting 145 pound, the real hardest hitting 145 er right here. This guy TKOs people. When I knock people out, they don't fucking move. They're not, who the fuck is that guy? Who the fuck is that? You know damn well who I am. Who the fuck is that? Um, oh my God. I don't know, when I take that so, guy's belt, leprechaun. Oh, good one. When I take that guy's belt, I don't, I'm looking around, I don't know what anyone else has for me around here. I might have to jump up and fucking drag Floyd Mayweather out there and see what the fuck he's at again. Uh, this question is for Eddie Alvarez. You've been mentioning that Conor McGregor is not a championship fighter. Uh, he only has two to three rounds. Yet in your professional career, you've only went to the fifth round twice and lost one of them. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Hey, what's your question? Yeah, he has a soon to tell what's you your question? With that. I love it. I love it. My question was clearly, you've only been to the fifth round twice in your professional career and lost one of them. You're complaining that he has no his gas. Qu his no question energy. is, why are you talking, talking about? shit? Yeah. That's his question. Why the fuck you up there talking shit? Say it like it is. You're blessed. You're blessed that I chose you. You're blessed that I chose to whoop your ass next. Say it like a fucking is. You're Wow, what a day, what a day. Uh, there, were some, there were some other highlights, of course. I thought the reaction that Joanna Jacek got was amazing. Uh, she was introduced, the crowd ripped up into applause. I thought that was really cool. Uh, Tyron Woodley was booed relentless. I was actually surprised at Eddie Alvarez getting booed because he's from Philadelphia. He's kind of a local guy. I, I remember when he used to fight in like Bodog and some of the other smaller promotions, he used to command a huge audience of people that would come out from Philadelphia in those shows in like Jersey and stuff to see him, so I was a little surprised he got such a such a venomous reaction from the crowd. Uh, Tyron Woodley got booed relentlessly, good or bad, you know. And I, when you when you get booed like that, you know, calling attention to it, calling attention to it is tough because you almost don't want to call attention to it because it just kind of rags them on more. It happened with Daniel Cormier uh, when he did the press conference with John Jones a while back, where he basically, um, you know, he called to attention the fact that he was getting booed, which of course turns the crowd to boo you even more. Uh, you do kind of feel for Tyron because he, I mean, he doesn't he hasn't done anything wrong. He's not a bad guy. Tyron's a great champion. He knocked out uh, Robbie Lawler, one of the baddest dudes on the planet, and uh, and he's fighting Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, which is a fight everyone wanted to see to begin with. Uh, so I'm not really sure why he's getting booed. But yeah, calling attention to it will never win you favor. Um, you know, Wonder Boy did enjoy uh, you know a little bit of fanfare uh, for his part. He got some chance in there. But yeah, the presser was fun, man. It was fun to watch. I think they had like a hundred thousand people watching at one point, or ninety thousand people, or something crazy number like that watching at one point during the show. I mean, listen, that's the attention that Conor McGregor gets. I mean, that's the reason why he was the target all along to headline this card because there's not going to be a bigger fight or a bigger fighter on this card than to bring in a guy like Conor McGregor. Gregor, who's going to bring in a huge audience. Every eyeball is going to be on it. And guess what? Everybody else benefits. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, yes, the presser might have sucked for a guy like Yo Romero, who didn't really get any questions, or a guy like Jeremy Stevens, who ended up kind of getting roasted by Conor McGregor. But at the same time, the attention that he commands also brings attention to everybody else. Because when you're watching a Conor McGregor fight, you're going to tune in at least a little bit early to see some of the other fights. And this card is incredible from top to bottom. I mean, three title fights, all of them good. I mean, Joanna and Jacek and Carolina, that's a great fight. I love the Tyron Woodley uh, Wonder Boy fight. And then, like I said, the undercard is ridiculous. So there's not a bad fight on this card. This is, you know, it, it, when you think about what 20. When you think about what 2016 is going to represent at the end of the year, this will probably go down as the biggest year in UFC history in terms of money, not only because the, the organization sold for $4 billion, but you look at UFC 196, Diaz McGregor won. That ended up being a ridiculously huge pay-per-view, broke records, 1.5 million buys, whatever it was. Then you go to UFC 200. Yes, it got marred a little bit because of the whole thing with John Jones and obviously Brock Lesnar afterwards, but you had Brock coming back. You had the women's title. You had you know, Jose and Frankie ended up being a big fight there. Again, pay-per-views weren't off the charts, but they were pretty damn good for that card. Then you move right into 202. You had Connor Aldo 2, or Connor, Connor Aldo, Connor uh, Diaz 2, 
Once again, rumors are they broke the all-time record for pay-per-view. Huge fight, monstrous fight, tons of attention. Everyone wanted a piece of that. Ended up being a great fight. Now you have New York, UFC 205. Once again, Conor McGregor, Eddie Alvarez, huge fight. Eddie Alvarez, phenomenal champion. Been around the sport for a long time. Has never been a massive draw. And listen, there, I understand that. That's that's how the sport works. Some guys are draws, some guys aren't. Eddie has never been a massive draw. But he's going to enjoy the fruits of facing a guy like Conor McGregor. And listen, if he wins, you know that's going to be a huge, a huge moment for Eddie Alvarez to beat a Conor McGregor, whether he deserved it or not. Whether and and I I say this all the time. Strike that word from your vocabulary if you are an MMA fan. Deserves has nothing to do with it. It's about money fights. It's about entertainment. It's about giving people what they want to see. And Eddie versus Connor is the biggest fight you can make at lightweight right now. There's just no denying that. So you got that on there for Eddie. He has a chance to really build his career off of this. And then UFC 207. And we're not. Even, I'm not even addressing 206 because there's still a chance that George St. Pierre comes back. I'm not giving up hope on that. If George St. Pierre comes back at 206, imagine how huge that would be. And then at 207, the rumor main event, at least for right now, is Ronda Rousey against Amanda Nunes. Ronda Rousey's comeback is going to be huge. It is going to be monstrous. Now, imagine... Imagine when you put all that together, when you put all that together at the end of one year, that is ridiculous. I mean, that is a ridiculous string of of boats, if you want to put it in the, in terms of like poker. You know what I mean? Like that is a ridiculous string of cards over the span of one year. And for all that to happen in 2016 is insane. Obviously, we still got a lot to play out before then, though, because, you know, November 12th isn't here yet. Card hasn't happened. Sadly, I have to I have to be a little bit, you know, pragmatic and say, listen, injuries could happen, things can change. But if this card stays intact and it, it delivers the way that I think it will deliver, it could be the biggest card in UFC history, uh, both at the box office and also on pay-per-view. And then you got Ronda potentially coming back at the end of the year. That is going to be a huge, monstrous card as well because there's so much interest in Ronda Rousey and what she's going to be able to do after that Holly Holm fight, after the layoff, after everything she's gone through. Can she come back and be the same Ronda Rousey or better? All those questions could be answered by the time December 30th rolls around. I can't wait for it. It's going to be huge. All right. With that said, let's move into our guests. We're going to kick things off this week with the middleweight champion of the world, Michael Bisping. He's fighting Dan Henderson next Saturday night, UFC 204. We had Dan on the podcast last week. Obviously, Bisping was over in England filming a movie, actually, and he came home just recently to kind of finish up his training camp, get about four weeks of training here at home in the United States. Uh, Obviously, he's going to be traveling back to Manchester, his hometown, as he gets ready to defend his title for the first time. Uh, I know there's been a lot said about this card because Dan Henderson, you know, doesn't there's the word again, deserve the title shot, but this is still a big moment. It's something Bisping wanted, it's something Dan wanted. Dan's going to retire after this. There's a lot on the line coming into this fight. So let's talk to the champ, Michael Bisping. Mike, how's it going? I'm good, buddy. How are you doing? I'm fantastic, man. Thank you for taking the time for me as always. No worries, my friend. One second, sending a message. You still need picking up. Sorry, <laughs> partners. I just realized I gotta pick those motherfuckers up. I still need picking up. Hold on, one more message to David, and I am all yours. No problem. Uh, one second, buddy. How you been? I am fantastic. Fence- I'm good, man. Good. Just uh, gearing up for your fight, man. I'm excited for Manchester. Yeah, me too. It's going to be nuts, man. One second, got to pick a pose. Sorry, we'll be late. Sorry, we'll be late. A bit. Anyway. But I never got a strike, David. Oh, yours, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so, how's everything, man? I know you were over in England filming a movie, and now you're back in uh, in training camp. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, I, I said prior to the uh, to going out there filming that movie, I said to Jason Perillo, I was like, you know what, this will be a good distraction. It'll, it'll stop me from all the training and all these things. Um, and, but, of course, when I went out there, I started panicking. You know, I mean, I was still training. My Muay Thai coach, Darren Morris from Salford Muay Thai, he came down and lived with me in London whilst I was filming the movie. Um, so the the, the, uh, the filming schedule was pretty grueling, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And it was very physical stuff, lots of fight scenes and boxing and things like that. So by the end of the day, I was exhausted. But, you know, I, I had no choice. I had to go train again in the evening. Uh, and, and I did that. But as I say, as I said, I was still kind of freaking out that maybe, um, you know, I shouldn't be doing the movie. But to be honest, um, 
it worked out perfectly. I, I was absolutely right. It was a good distraction because I'm, well, I'm just under three weeks now. It was four weeks out when I came back. I'm flying. Uh, my strength is good. My condition is good. My weight is uh, pretty much on track. You know, I'm just going to lose an extra pound or two. But, uh, yeah, everything's really, really good. And fingers crossed, on track for a great victory. Yeah. Well, I know you told me after the Rockhold fight that that was a lesson learned about, you know, not overtraining. Yeah. And obviously you weren't going to, you know, take 10 days for a beer like that one. But, you know, you said that was a lesson. I mean, you know, in your head, I'm sure it's tough to break those habits. But now that you're back, does it does it kind of feel like this was a good idea all along? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I actually said to my wife the other day, I said, it's crazy. I mean, this week I've trained incredibly hard. And I said to my wife, it's just insane to think that I used to do this for eight weeks at a time. You know, it's, the human body can't take it. And certainly, when you've had a career as long as mine and you've done it for as long as you have, as I have, part of me, um, you don't need to do that. Yeah, of course, you've got to get yourself in shape. But if you exercise some discipline, you know, and then don't get too out of shape and this and that, then you shouldn't need to kill yourself for eight weeks. And I just think everybody in MMA overtrains. I understand why they do it, all the different disciplines that you've got to, uh, you know, that you've got to train for, and then the sparring, the conditioning, the running, and all that stuff. You know, I understand why it happens, but I honestly believe everybody goes in there overtrained. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this week I'm feeling good. I've still got two really hard weeks of training and then a week tapering down before the fight. I mean, prior to the movie, of course, I did three weeks with Jason Ned, and then prior to that, I was in Thailand. Yeah, I was on vacation, but I was training as well. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, yeah, it's, it's going to work out just right. Yeah. So I know we talked after after the win. I know we've talked a couple times after the win. But, you know, this was this was the fight you wanted. You wanted Dan Henderson. This was, you know, Dan's retiring. He knows win, lose, or draw after this fight. He's retiring. So you knew this was kind of your last chance to get a shot at him. But when the UFC finally called and said, hey, we're going to give you Dan Henderson, but we're also going to do it in Manchester. I mean, could this have played out any better? Not really, no, to be honest. I mean, uh, I'll be honest. I mean, getting revenge on Dan Henderson is just something that, like, uh, massively consumed me, of course. Uh, I, I always took exception to the fact that his company logo, if you will, was being led unconscious. You know, that always kind of pissed me off a little bit. Uh, and I wanted to uh, get that one back. But it wasn't like it completely consumed me. Uh, but yeah, you know, revenge is always something that we want, though. You know, and when the UFC came to me with the fight, I was like, yeah, 100%. And then when they said Manchester, as you say, it doesn't get any better than that. You know what I mean? being the first UK champion and then having my first defense in the UK, you know, I mean, that, that's just absolutely perfect. And I think as well, the, uh, the, the the demand for it is there as well. I mean, the arena sold out in six minutes uh, for a fight that's going to be happening at 5 a.m. So it's just incredible. I mean, I was completely overwhelmed and humbled by it. I was actually kind of concerned about how the ticket sales might go because the fight was happening so late local time. And of course, you know, as we saw, six minutes. I believe that must be a record for a UFC sellout. So, yeah, incredible. Can't wait. But of course, with great demand and fast ticket sales and all this type of stuff, that does bring pressure. You know, it's all well and good selling out the arena. Now we're going to go and perform. So. That's why I'm headed to the gym right now. <laughs> you've been, you know, you've been a guy that, you know, you you really launched the European market for the UFC. I mean, before Conor McGregor was around, there was Michael Bisping, and Michael Bisping was the guy who sold out arenas and, you know, had that 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 fevered crowd, you know, on your side. I mean, having experienced that before, I know this is different. It's your first title defense, it's Dan Henderson's main event, all these different things. But do you feel like going through that before is going to help? Because this isn't necessarily new to you. I mean, yes, it's a new experience being champion, you know, first title defense. But you know, you you know what that. Crowd I was gonna be like, when song two hits, you know they're gonna lose their freaking minds. And I mean, you've been through all that before. Yeah, exactly. To be honest, I have been through it before, and you know that, that experience will be very, very grateful. I mean, but on the flip side, you know, so is Dan Henderson. You know, Dan Henderson is, is there's no one more experienced than Dan Henderson. He's as experienced as the job, even though I've had the most wins in UFC history. But you, you see the point I'm making. Dan Henderson is no stranger to the fight game and how to handle these things. So 
Yeah, for me, the crowd are going to go crazy and it's going to be insane. But as you say, I've been doing it long before Conor McGregor knew what MMA was. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just another night at the office. Don't get me wrong, it's an important night at the office. It's a night at the office that I'm going to cherish, that I'm going to prepare for diligently and all this type of stuff. But that's the way I've got to look at it. This is just another opponent. You know, I call it the moment or the fight, my first defense or the fight that he sold out in six minutes. I can't let any of that alter the way that I approach the fight and the way that I perform. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you about Dan Henderson because I was at the press conference, obviously, uh, you know, a few weeks back in Vegas, and yeah, I know you talked a lot about, you know, obviously this fight, you know, is, is more on an even playing field. Dan was on TRT, we know all that, but I mean, at the at the end of the day, I mean, I, I, you know, do you feel like, you know, where you're at now and where Dan's at now? I mean, is this a much much different fight in terms of styles and in terms of, you know, the odds? I mean, I know you don't probably pay attention too much to odds, but you know, the last fight felt like it was pretty even going in, Dan was obviously a little more experienced than you, but now with you being the champion, feels like you're, you know, on the on the surge, the best you've ever been. I mean, do you kind of feel like this is kind of the reverse situation where you are the favorite and, and people are definitely expecting you to win this fight? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, I think without trying to be insulting or, or coming up with anything, uh, you know, I'm not trying to give you a headline or anything. I, I think the facts speak for themselves. You know, I think Dan is on the decline and, and I'm in the peak of my career, I feel like. So, uh, you know, I, and I think that's the fact. You know, I mean, if you look at the fact that he's not on TRT, you know, his body shape has changed a little bit now and, you know, he has been racking up some losses. Of course, he's still got that dangerous right hand. Like a long boy found that first time that the guy can still knock people out. Tim Boach found that he can still knock people out. So, of course, I don't want to be the third one to get knocked out by the old Dan Henderson on TRT. So I've got to be careful. Uh, that said, I, I, I've i still got the same advantages in this fight that I had in the first fight, but Dan was still able to knock me out in that first fight, so I've got to be careful. You know, in that first fight, I believed I was the better striker. I believed I was faster uh, and younger and all these things, and that's still the case now. I'm definitely faster. I'm definitely a better striker. I think, actually, I've got a more well-rounded skill set. But it doesn't matter, it only takes one. And Dan was able to land that shot, you know, and I think that's what makes Dan uh, dangerous in this fight. The fact that he knows he has the knockout power and he knows it only takes one and he knows he's done it before. And win or lose, he's going to retire to this fight. So he's got nothing to lose. So he's going to come out there, I'm assuming, like a fan out of hell. He's going to wait for the right time and he's going to swarm. He's going to swarm like crazy and hope that one connects. You know, so I've got to be careful. I've got to be ready to weather that initial storm. And when the time comes, I've got to be ready. I've got to be fast on my feet, get out of the way. And then I've got to punish him. I mean, make no mistake, I'm not looking on, uh, you know, being on my back foot this whole fight. I'm going to be going forward and pressuring that. Uh, but I've, I've got to do it wisely. I've got to be selective with my aggression. And I believe uh, I, I have the, the formula to do that. And I'll get the job done. You know what I mean? As I say, it only takes one from Dan. I'm going to be careful. Yeah. With that said, you know, you went into the Rockhold fight. You know, you knew, you know, you, you wanted to win. Didn't matter if you won in the first round, you won in the fifth round. But it was a sweet victory knocking Luke out, you know, getting your vengeance after all the trash he had talked and the way he was just kind of discounting you and obviously the way he was talking about your first fight with him. It, I know it was sweeter to go in there and knock him out in the first round. So I know you're ready yeah. for a five-round war. I know you're ready to win this by submission. I know you're ready to win this any, any way you can. But is it kind of apropos that, you know, it would be a sweet victory if you can knock out Dan Henderson to kind of pay him back the same way that he, you know, that he he fought you and beat you the first time. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I am one million percent looking for a finish in this fight. I mean, of course, when it's all said and done, as you say, a win is a win, and I'll take it any way I can. But I'm looking for a stoppage. I want to go out there and have a showcase performance. You know, I feel I'm on the best form of my career, and I want to continue that trend. Now, after this fight, I want all those other dicks in middleweight to be like, oof, I'm not sure if I do want to fight him, actually. I'm going to put a beating on Dan Henderson like he's never had in his life. I'm going to make him look old. I'm going to make him look every one of those 46 years that he has on his clock. I'm going to beat him to the punch. I'm going to bloody him up. And then when he's done, when he's ready, when he's gassed and he's beat up and he hasn't got a hope left in his body, then I'm going to go into the finish and take him out in round three. <laughs> I love it. you got it planned out. I like that. <laughs> 
you, uh, you know, you, you know, since you've been on top, Mike, you know, obviously you, you've waited for this moment for a long time, and you knew that, you know, as soon as you were becoming champion, you know, you've, it's funny because you've always been the hunted. You've never actually, you know, you've always been the hunter, but you know, people have always wanted you. People have always called you out. When you hear the other middleweights chirping and yelling and and and, and bitching and moaning, I mean, do you sit back and kind of revel in a little bit that you know now you you know now you're on top. Now they have to kind of not not to say you're going to pick and choose your opponents. You've never done that, but you know what I mean. You you know you're the guy in control. You're the king. You're the guy. Yeah, no, absolutely. Every time I hear the wind, you complain and bitch, you whine and moan, it puts a smile on my face. I sit back here, I take a glance up to the top of my TV where the belt sits, and I, I have a little struggle to myself, each and every time when Chris Wyman is whining, when Joel Romero is going on, and, and Rockhold is going on, Jack and all these people, oh my God, I, I laugh. I sit there, and uh, I look at, oh, I nearly ran into the back of my car. I sit there and I, I look at the man as I say, I crack a smile and I take a little chuckle to myself. I've never dumped an opponent. I've never turned down an opponent. And I certainly don't intend on starting now. Chris Weidman, he's fighting Yo Romero. You know why I love that fight so much? Because one of them has to lose. And I can't wait to find out which one it's going to be. I made the best man win. And if uh, the landscape is fitting, then I'll find the winner of that fight. Uh, but one of them has to lose. And to be honest, I'm rooting for Chris Wyman in that fight. Yoel Romero, reduced sentence or not, still testing positive for performance enhancing drugs. We all know my stance on that. Chris Wyman, if he gets beat, well, he's been a mighty little bitch lately as well. So either way, one of them gets beat. And that will again put a nice little smile on my face. <laughs> and then obviously you got the other fight that just got made, Rockhold and Jockery, and I'm sure you know the winner of that's going to be gunning for you as well. And I'm sure you're going to be enjoying that fight as well. Oh, for sure, for sure, absolutely. I, uh, I mean, I mean that, that, that's a good fight. It's a good rematch. I mean, the first fight was very, very close. And then once again, you know, someone has to win, someone has to lose, you know. And uh, well, for me, I've to face all four of these. Now. I'm only going to face two of them. I mean, listen, uh, I, I kind of fancy. Uh, fighting Jack Ray. I, I was looking forward to the challenge that he brings to the table. I've got a lot of respect for him as a fighter. And as a person, he carries himself with class, you know, I've got nothing against Jack Ray. You know, he's a tough son of a bitch, and that would have been a very, very tough fight. If Brockhold wins, then I guess maybe we, we, we can do it again, if that's what the UFC want to do. I mean, I'm certainly, as I said, I, I fought Rockhold once, I wanted to fight him twice, I've got no problem fighting him the third time. And if it's Jack Ray that comes out on top, as I said, you know what I mean? If he wins, then, then, then he's the next number one contender for sure. Yeah, but it's a good time to be Michael Bisping. You got a lot of options. You got Dan Henderson. You get your vengeance uh, coming up here in just a couple weeks. You get to fight in England, which is going to be insane. I mean, I, I talk about the insane crowds. You know, it's Connor, Connor in Ireland, Bisping in England, and, and what I just experienced last week. I think it's Stipe in Cleveland. I think those are the crowds we need to be talking about now. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, as you said, it's a good time to be me, and I guess it is. I mean. It's always been a good time to be me, to be honest. I've always been happy with my mom in life, you know. I mean, I've always worked hard and I've got a great family and this and that. So I've always been happy. Yeah, I guess, you know, being the champion is the icing on the cake after all this hard work and, you know, watching all these other people now fall over themselves to try and get a shot. Yeah, as I say, every time I hear about this, I read about it, every time they take shots on the internet, I just look at the belt and I have a little smile. <laughs> so my last question, Mike, I'll get you out of here on this so you can get to practice. You know, you, you waited so long to get here. You you know what it's like. You know what it's like to, you know, kind of be the number two guy, the number three guy, chomping at the bit to get here. Now that you finally got the champion, you are the man. You are the king. How hard is it going to be for Dan Henderson or any of these other guys to pull that title out of your hands? Listen, I haven't come this far, worked this hard, give it up to Dan Henderson in Manchester in my first title defense. No way. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. Believe me, I'm feeling the best I ever had. I've generated the most power with my shots. My mentality is the best it's ever been. I'm, I'm relaxed, I'm focused, I'm calm, I'm enjoying myself, and there's just no way in this world that Dan Henderson is going to come over there and take that, you know? No way. Listen, the only way that he takes that belt is if he knocks me unconscious, like he did last time. Other than that, other than that, I will not give up. I will fight like a maniac, as simple as that. I love it. Mike, it is always a pleasure. I appreciate you taking time as always. I look forward to seeing that movie, by the way. that My name is Lenny. That looks like a good movie, man. I'm looking forward to yeah, seeing you know, that. It's going to be really cool. It's going to be awesome. 
really is Mike, so uh, that's his name, Matt. So, all right, dude, I better go because I'm trying to pick up this goddamn fucking spine part. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I appreciate it, buddy. Have, have a good fight, man. I'll talk to you afterwards. Anytime. Take care. All right, bye bye. Hey, it's Damon here from the Fight Society Podcast. I got to tell you guys, I went to the store the other day to buy some razors. Now, I have a beard, and I don't shave that often, but every day, every other day, I have to get rid of the neck beard. Not a fan. Or a fan of the the, the, the beard that kind of grows up a little too high on your face, make you look a little bit too much like a wolf man. So I do, I do shave pretty regularly. And I went to the store the other day to buy some razors, and I kind of forgot how expensive razors are. Ridiculous, right? You get like three or four razors and it's like 20 bucks. It's ridiculous. You have to take out a small loan to afford razors every month. And that's why I teamed up with dollarshaveclub.com. I mean, they have incredible deals and a plan that really fits you. Uh, You know, you don't have to get, you know, one razor, two razors. You can have a a range of different plans to check out. Amazing blades. and, And that way you're not shaving on a rusty blade. And it feels like you're going to rip the neck hair out from your neck or the hair from your beard out of your face. It, it, it's, it's great. You get a new razor every month. You sign up. And I don't have to deal with the hassle and the pain in the butt of going to the drugstore or the store or you know selling a kidney to be able to afford razor blades. Now, it sounds crazy. I know. You don't think about the cost of razor blades you know, if you shave every day or every other day. But I'm telling you right now, dollarshaveclub.com is the way to go. I got these products just recently, and I started using them, and they are pretty amazing. I, I, you know, it's it, it, you can get a kit that has uh, the executive blade, which is what I use. Uh, they have a, a shave butter you can use, which is actually way better, at least in my opinion, than any shave cream I've used recently. You know, shave creams you get the stuff from the store, you know, pay a couple bucks for it, and you know, you get the nicks, you get the the, the, the cuts, the scrapes, things like that. This stuff is is fantastic. It's it's amazing. I'm telling you right now, dollarshaveclub.com is the way to go. So here's your chance to see why over 3 million members like me love Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club is so confident in the quality of all their products, now you can get your first month of the club for free. Just pay shipping. That's it. And that's far less than you're going to pay for any razor blades in a store. After that, it's just a few bucks a month. No long-term commitment. No hidden fees. There's no reason not to do it. Get yours at dollarshaveclub.com slash fight. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash fight. I think that UFC 204 card, very underrated. You know, Gegard Musasi, who we're going to have on the podcast next week, he's taking on Vitor Belfort. That's a fun fight. And I am looking forward to Michael Bisping fighting Dan Henderson. You know, it, it, the, the the unfortunate side of this card is it does get sandwiched in, you know, between uh, you know between another big card, which is, you know, UFC 205. There's going to be a lot of eyeballs on November 12th at MSG. And unfortunately, you know, pretty much anything and everything around that, um, you know, kind of gets lost in the, in the shuffle a bit uh, because of the way Way that you know the magnitude of a certain card. I mean, that's what happened with 201 when you had Tyron Woodley and Robbie Lawler, which is a phenomenal fight, but then you had it sandwiched in between UFC 200, which was going to get a monster amount of attention, and then UFC 202, which was Connor and Diaz. So, again, it's a it's it's a, it maybe a little bit unfortunate timing that a card like this happens with a really fun fight card, but like I said, we will still get to see it all go down here in just a couple weeks in uh, in England. Another big story that came out of that UFC 205 press conference yesterday, or or should I say after the press conference, it was over over was the news that Jose Aldo uh, has asked for his release from the UFC and basically said if he doesn't get his release, he's going to retire from the sport. He's obviously very upset that Conor McGregor is not coming back down to featherweight to fight him. He's very upset that you know Conor McGregor isn't being stripped of the featherweight title to fight him or or to at least you know strip him of the belt so that he can become the linear champion again whatever the case may be, and he's obviously upset that he feels like Dana White lied to him and uh, and he's not happy about the way he's been treated. A couple of points to this. You feel for Jose Aldo. I mean, you do. I mean, you can't help but feel for the guy a little bit because he has been promised a lot, and none of it has really delivered. He was promised a rematch with, you know, with, with uh, Conor McGregor if he beat uh, Frankie Edgar at UFC 200. That didn't happen. He was promised that if Conor McGregor didn't uh, defend the title, that they would uh, they would strip him of the belt. That didn't happen. And now Jose Aldo is going to be forced to sit on the sidelines and watch as Conor McGregor goes to become a second weight world champion in in the lightweight division. And on top of that, uh, you know, Conor has said, even though Dana Dana said you know yesterday or day before yesterday that Conor would have to give up one of the titles. 
you know, when he, when he, if he wins both titles, if he wins the lightweight title, he has to give up one of them. He has to choose. He's either going to be the featherweight champion or the lightweight champion. He can't be both. But Connor yesterday said, you know, I'm not giving up either belt. If I win it, I'm going to pick and choose. I mean, you heard the clip earlier in the show. Um, to that point, at, the, at this point, I should say you kind of have to believe Connor a little bit. I mean, you know, there, there have been a lot of a lot of you know idle threats, so to speak, made against him. But Connor has pretty much time and again called his shots. Now, I know that makes a lot of people angry. Uh, I I personally think. While I don't agree with holding up both divisions for a long period of time, I don't agree with that. Uh, right now, the featherweight division has been on hold technically for nine months. That's not that long. Conor McGregor has not fought in the featherweight division for about nine months at this point. Um, it's not that long. Jose Aldo was out for well over a year a couple of times in his career. It was due to injury. I know I put out a tweet yesterday and made people lose their minds. Uh, I know it's due to injury and, and choosing, quote unquote, not to fight in the division is different than being injured. I get all that. But at the same time, the the timeline is still the same. The, the, the title didn't get defended for well over a year, and so Connor's been out for nine months. Now, you know there is a there is a breaking point to this. If Connor beats Alvarez and then doesn't go back to featherweight or doesn't give up the featherweight title, there is a breaking point where you have to basically kind of say, okay, that, enough's enough. We gotta we gotta move forward with the division, even if even if it's without Connor McGregor, even though he's the biggest star in that weight class. But right now, I don't think we're at that breaking point. We're nine months in. We still have time. He could still beat. Eddie Alvarez and then, you know, book his fight at featherweight in, you know, February, Super Bowl weekend. I mean, that would still be a huge card. Or maybe it's March or April. Either way, you know, that's still a timeline that, that would meet, you know, a criteria of other titles. I mean, you know, interim titles are out there. I mean, Jose Aldo is the interim champion. He could defend the belt against somebody else, as upsetting as that might be to him. Uh, I mean, Dana White is talking about making an interim title fight between John Jones and Anthony Rumble Johnson, and the winner fights the real champion. Well, meanwhile, the real champion's waiting to fight. Right. Daniel Cormier is healthy, okay? That's that to me is a much more egregious thing than what's going on with Connor because Connor's active, Connor's fighting, Connor's making big fights and and making a lot of money. And, and I get it; it's upsetting to Aldo. I understand that. But getting back to the point of Aldo, I mean, listen, a couple things on this. One, Aldo is not going to get released. I mean, we know that there's no chance he's getting released from his contract. The UFC will never let him out of his deal. Um, you know, they'll 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 come to the negotiating table and try to figure out a way to make him you know to get him back in the octagon. But he they they are not giving him up. They're not going to let him go and go to another organization. Just that's not going to happen. As far as retirement goes, I mean, it's possible. I mean, you know, I mean, Aldo Aldo has been around for a long time and he was on top of the world for a long time. So, you know, if he actually did retire, I wouldn't be completely shocked. I mean, you know, he's not, a, you know, he's not necessarily a young guy at this stage in his career. He's been around him. Mean, he was the longest reigning and greatest featherweight champion of all time. If he did retire, I would be surprised, but I wouldn't be shocked if that makes sense. Because I mean, listen, the guy has a family. He, I'm sure, he has a lot of money put away. Uh, he could potentially retire. He's in a different position than a lot of fighters because he has had a lot of money. He has made a lot of money during his career. I still don't buy it, though. I still don't think he's going to retire. I think that that itch and that, that that urge to fight will eventually come back around. And I think that, you know, once cooler heads prevail, and maybe it's after UFC 205 is over, maybe if Connor loses or if Connor wins, you know, maybe that motivates him even more to get back in there because he wants to have that shot at Connor. Maybe Aldo says, screw it. I want Connor so bad. Put me at 155 and I'll fight him. That would be fun. I mean, hell, I'd watch that all day if Connor if Aldo's like, you know, what? I don't even care about the title. Screw the title. Put me in there with Conor McGregor at 155 and let's do the damn thing. I'd be all for that. You know what I mean? Like, I would be all for that. So, you know, like I said, I, I personally don't think he's going to retire. I personally don't think this is going to stick. But I understand why he's upset. I, I get I get both sides of the coin. I get what Conor McGregor's doing by, you know, fighting bigger fights against Diaz, the rematch, and fighting Eddie Alvarez for the lightweight title, trying to make history. Uh, I also understand Conor's point of, yes, he fought Jose Aldo last December and knocked him out in 13 seconds, and he went through a lot to get to that point because of the whole, you know, the Chad Mendes thing, the injury the last time. You know, listen, what Conor's saying isn't wrong. You can take it as kind of a, you know, a boisterous, boastful way of saying, I knocked him out in 13 seconds, and you know, I toured the whole world with him, and I just don't have a lot of interest in that fight. Listen, is Jose Aldo the greatest featherweight champion of all time? Yes, he is. But 
I also understand Connor's point that he did knock him out with one punch in 13 seconds. Don't sit here and tell me it's not a fight. It was a lucky punch. There's no such thing. He caught him. I mean, listen, Jose Aldo has been through a lot of freaking wars throughout his career, and he never got, I mean, he never got put to sleep like that, ever. And Connor McGregor did it with one punch. I, I, I don't feel like taking that away from him. And the fight did just happen nine months ago. I mean, there was a lot of complaints when people were talking about Cain Velasquez getting a shot at Junior Dos Santos a rematch without fighting someone else first and then, you know, coming back after he got knocked out in a minute. Um, I understand Aldo did, you know, go out and beat Frankie Edgar. He did. And, 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 and that was supposed to be enough to get the fight with Connor. It didn't happen. But again, Jose fought Frankie in, in, in July, he could still very easily fight Connor in February or March. I mean, you know, depending on how things go out with this Alvarez fight, you know, judging by Connor's schedule, he could easily have that fight put together February, March, and that's not that much longer than he would typically sit out. I understand why he's upset that he feels like people have lied to him, and let's be honest, they have, uh, or they've, they've, they've said it and just not carried through with their promises. I don't know if you want to call that a lie or just, you know, not following through, whatever the case may be. So I get why Aldo's upset. I'm sympathetic to what I, Aldo's upset, but I also understand why Conor McGregor is doing what he's doing and why the UFC is doing what they're doing with Conor McGregor. So it's a, I don't think it's an either or proposition. I don't think you can just sit here and say one's wrong and one's right. Uh, I understand why Jose Aldo is upset, but I also understand why Conor McGregor is doing what Conor McGregor is doing. And I also understand why the UFC is doing what they're doing with Conor McGregor, putting him in this title fight, headlining UFC 205, lightweight title. He has a chance to become the first ever simultaneous two-weight division champion i get that i understand the 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 spotlight that comes from that um we haven't had that before yes we have had two weight champions before but no one has ever done it at the same time you know the last guy if i'm not mistaken the last guy had a chance to do was bj penn when he fought george st pierre uh with the you know he was the lightweight champion he was going up to fight him at welterweight obviously it didn't end well for him and this may not end well for connor i mean he could absolutely get slept by eddie alvarez eddie alvarez hits like a freaking truck and he's a damn good fighter you know what i mean like this could end very badly for Connor. We don't know that, but the fact that we get to see it play out, it was supposed to happen in March when he was going to fight Dos Anjos. It all fell apart when Dos Anjos got injured. We never got to see it. And now they have an opportunity to make it happen again. Why would you not want to make it happen? I get it. I understand it. And I also understand why Jose is so upset, but I still don't think long-term Jose is going to stay retired. I just don't see it happening. All right, let's move on to our next guest. He's an old friend of mine. Uh, I used to talk to him on The Ultimate Fighter. His season, The Ultimate Fighter, when I did the uh, the radio correspondence, quote-unquote, for The Ultimate Fighter. Him and TJ Dillashaw, funny enough, were the two radio correspondents I had that season for season 14, I believe was the number. Uh, now he's taking on John Lineker in what should be a freaking fire fight. I love this fight. Main event, Saturday night. Main card starts at 11 p.m. Eastern on FS1. Let's talk to John the Magician Dodson. John Dodson, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing good, brother. How are you doing? Just got there working with Kira Mitt session and uh, coming to talk to you. I love it. I love it. I appreciate it as always, man. How's everything down in New Mexico? Well, it's hot. It's kind of getting colder now. It's about that fall. You know, that fall time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's weird. It's like it's not like an actual weather change. It's like winter. Oh, okay. But what, it's it, no, yeah, yeah, it's like winter. It's winter, no snow. <laughs> so how's everything man obviously fight is just around the corner main event second fight at bantam back at bantam weight gotta feel good getting that main event yep i mean i get to go toe to toe with a guy that i wanted to fight at 125 and see if they can show that I have more devastating power and i get to do it now I love it. I love it. Now, we talked after you uh, after you decided to go back to Bantamweight after you left Flyweight. Obviously, you had a very impressive knockout of Romani Gamburian. I mean, how, how did it feel? I mean, how did it feel to, to, to go through, you know, that 135 fight to, to not have to go through that brutal weight cut? I don't know. How, how, did, how, did, uh, how did that all feel for you? Well, it felt amazing because I get to showcase why I, I deserve to be at 135, and then I, it's no longer a difference between what I'm doing at 125 to 135, and I can prove that I can do the same thing at 145. I'll have the same type of destructive force and be laughing about it. Kind of, kind of give me a sense because I know we talked about this before, but but kind of give me a sense of how much different your body and your and everything felt not having to cut that extra 10 pounds. Well, it felt good because I could sit there and have an easier, an easier time making the way my body felt healthier. I was more joyful, I could say. 
Hold on, I'm like, oh, sorry, I'm still in the gym, my bad. <laughs> I was more happier, I was joyful, I got to sit there and joke around more, and I didn't feel like I was killing myself to the brink of death. I can feel like I can bring the death to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think, because I don't think a lot of people knew because you had such impressive performances at Flyway. I don't think people knew how tough of a weight cut that was for you. Yeah, it's 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 kind of brutal. Like I walk around pretty heavy, like one fifty six to one sixty at times. I like fluctuates in that air, that range, but it makes it harder for me to think that it's it's gonna be easier to drop down or fluctuate going back and forth. And a lot of times I wanted to make back to back returns because it'd be easier for me to keep that weight off. But having fights go six months, seven months layoff, it just sucks. Yeah, yeah. So you come out of the gate right away. You get the big knockout. It takes you, you know, less than a minute. You, you, you earn the first knockout out of the gate. How happy were you that the UFC did give you a matchup like a guy like Lineker, who is, you know, obviously he's been on a big win streak. He's a top guy right now. It kind of seems like, uh, you know, there's no, you're not going to, you're not going to wait to get into the title contention, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, that's awesome because now everybody can realize that a uh, belt deserves to be around my waist and it needs to happen soon, sooner than later. And I want to make sure I'm a cemented by knocking out Lineker. It's not like a, I hate the dude. Not like he can't knock me out. It's just, it's my time. And if TJ Dillashaw thinks that it's going to be his time, then he should try fighting me again and see how well he's going to do. He will talk about how, how bad he wants to fight Dominic Cruz. And he's suddenly saying, I won against Dominic. But he, he can't sit there and say that he beat, or he said he beat Dominic. He said he beat Rafael Sunsau. And he got the revenge against Rafael Sunsau. He's going to try to beat against the same thing against Dominic. Why isn't he called me out? I'm the only one that put him out, put him to sleep. They made him on like on wobbly legs where her being had to cuddle him so that he wouldn't fall over again. <laughs> it's just hurts my heart. Yeah, yeah. Did you did you want to fight TJ after after the Manny oh. fight, or, or or were you happy with John Lineker? I was happy with Lineker. I was wanting to fight somebody soon because I thought knocking somebody out in 47 seconds would either one give me a bonus or two give me a fight within like you know a month. And then here we are six months later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How frustrating is that? I mean, how frustrating is that when you when you do have that? Could you imagine, like you said, you could keep the ball rolling pretty quickly with another fight? You know, you could be, I mean, you could be fighting for the title by, you know, the, the end of this year if you if you continue to fight like that. So how frustrating is that when you don't, when you know, when, you, when you're ready and, and, you, and still you're sitting? Well, it, it sucks because not only do I feel like I was sitting, I feel like everyone was, like, saying no. Like, oh, that's not a per- good matchup for me. This isn't gonna work. I mean, I know Caraway kept on saying no. <laughs> he would he wanted to fight Lineker instead of me, and so me and he told Sean that he was hurt fighting against me. I was offered to Brian Caraway, and he was like, "No, I'm hurt. I don't think I can take that fight." He got offered John Lineker. Oh yeah, I'll take that fight. What day is it? <laughs> Are you kidding? Come on, be a man. If you want to sit there and say that you want a title shot, you fight anybody. If we are the best in the world, we are not allowed to say no. We should be moving forward and continue on knocking people out and cementing our legacy as being the best in the world. If you want to be the best, you have to fight all the best, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's yes. the, and, and that, agrees with me. Isn't that the point? Isn't that the point to be the best? you got to fight the best? Isn't that what Ric Flair always said? To be the man, you got to beat the man? Isn't that what they always say? Yeah. <laughs> I always thought that our job as fighters, we just fight. I mean, everybody takes a, a million fights to get to the big show, and then finally, just as they get to the big show, they're like, I'm going to take this one off. I don't think I want to take that one. I might lose, so I don't get cut. If that's the case, then shit, there's, there should be a lot of people being cut soon. Yeah. How, uh, I mean, how, I don't know, angry, maybe that's the wrong word, whatever, but I mean, what, how does it make you feel when you hear that Caraway turns you down and Dillashaw isn't calling you, isn't calling you out because obviously you, you did, you did knock him out, you did beat him. I mean, is there, what, what runs through your mind when you hear that? I mean, I guess kudos to John Lineker because he did accept the fight, right? Yeah. Well, it is kudos to him because of the fact that it's just going to be a strong fight. It's going to be a barn burner between the both of us. But it is disheartening to hear, like, so many people. Well, to have to sit on the bench. I don't want to ride the bench for ever. I want to go in and just fight, have fun. Like that's the whole point. I enjoy fighting for the fans, so they can see the beautiful destruction that I can out unfold. <laughs> and yet, it just hurts when I don't get to perform and I don't have a, a big enough stage to do anything. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you, you know, so obviously you look at Lineker, you look at what he's been doing lately. I mean, obviously very impressive. He got that knockout over Michael McDonald. That's you know probably his biggest win. Obviously he knocked out Francisco Rivera. He's had some impressive performances. But are you are you seeing a, a different John Lineker at, at Bantamweight than what we saw at Flyweight, or is, or is he just fighting the right competition? He's fighting just the right competition because people haven't figured him out yet. Look, everybody that he's been knocking out is just want to stand in front of him and think that that's going to be the way to go. They're like, oh, he was a, he was a flyweight. I'm going to have to go toe to toe with him. But when you see him fight people that have good footwork, <clears throat> like myself, it's going to be a create create a problem for him. He has a hard time making sure he can trap people against the cage and do what he wants to do and sit there and brawl with everyone. And I'm not going to sit there and brawl with him. Just early in the fight, I can't say I won't. Well, I won't be there for him to land those big, heavy shots that he's been putting people to sleep with. Yeah, you've gone five rounds, and you've gone five rounds with the best fighters in the world, so that's not new to you. But do you think there's a chance this fight actually makes it five rounds? Because I, I just get the sense that there's not going to be a decision in this one. I don't think this is going five rounds at all. Like, to tell you the truth, I think this is probably like the most if we go, it's three hard, three rounds, and if no one's knocked out, then we're gonna have a lot of people booing. <laughs> you, uh, I, I talked to you numerous times when you were matched up with Demetrius Johnson. You had, you know, you had a lot to say about the promotion. You know, some of the flyweight stuff that was going on, why the flyweight division wasn't bigger. And obviously, I'm not, I'm not trying to rehash this up with Demetrius. But my question is this: Your second fight at flyweight, you and John Lineker are now headlining a show at bantamweight. You know, in Portland, big show, great card, all these things. I mean, does that kind of speak to the to the kind of star power and kind of the attraction that you do bring with your fights? That here you are, your second fight back at bantamweight. Way you are main eventing a card, and this feels like the attention this division needs exciting fighters who finish, and that pretty much speaks to you. It speaks to Lineker, and it speaks to like maybe a guy like Cody Garbrandt, you know, guys who go out there to fight and to finish. Yeah, everyone likes to finish. That's, that's why everyone loved heavyweight division for so long because they sat there and knocked each other out, and you knew at any given time one of those punches was going to land and put somebody to sleep. Now, you, now you do that to a 135, and now you got two guys that are going to do the exact same thing, that no matter who comes out on top, the fans are going to be the ones that are really coming out with the victory. Yeah. What does a, what does a win over John, Lan- uh, John Lineker do for you, John? What, what's the, what, where, where does this win put you? Hopefully it puts me into another fight. <laughs> <laughs> right, away, uh, right away fight, right? Right away fight. Yeah, I don't want to have to wait. Like, if they got me a fight, wait, like, what, this will be October? A fight in December would be awesome. Put me on a New Year's Eve card. Let's see what goes on. Yeah, yeah. Do you or think... Someone even, or if they need somebody to fight in New York, since if Conor McGregor decides to go back down to 40, uh, to 45 anytime soon. If he doesn't, I'll go ahead and fight Frankie Edgar. I'll fight for the interim title. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I am curious, John, and I'm not trying to look past John Lineker, but I am kind of curious because right now it looks like, and I know you know things aren't set in stone. It looks like it's going to be Cody and Dominic Cruz, you know, fighting for the title at some point, you know, in the near future. I mean, do you feel like with a win here? I mean, do you feel like TJ would be the next logical choice for you? Well, hopefully, it'll be anybody that's going to be in the top. Because right now I sit at number nine, so I will be willing to take up anybody that's going to be ahead of me. It'd be, it doesn't matter if it's going to be TJ, Cody Gombrandt, uh, Aldermaine Sterling, Brian Caraway, Javier uh, Sunsal, Dominic Cruz, uh, who else? Oh, Jimmy Rivera and CB, your eye favor. Mm, uh, whoever's going to be uh, above me, I would want to go ahead and secure a victory over them as well. Yeah, yeah. But this one, you know, this one has all the makings of, uh, you know, when I say fight of the year, I don't mean it that way because fight of the year entails it's going to be a close fight. And I, I'm quite sure you don't want this to be a close fight. You want it to be knockout of the year, right? Uh-huh. I, say, I say fight of the year. You yeah. want it to be knockout of the year, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me close. Uh, fight of the year because then uh, the missus will be killing me, saying, why did I get punched in the face way too much? And you're going like, to be scaring our daughter for the next couple of weeks <laughs> and our son and my son my son wouldn't care he'd be looking at me like dad you're a monster I was like yeah uh, he'd like, be doing it back to me she might not want me older <laughs> <laughs> who is this stranger you can't stranger scare the kids stranger dangerous 
<laughs> well, this is this is a this is a great spotlight. I know you shine in the in in the bright lights, John. I know you love that. I know you love the spotlight, and you got to enjoy the fact that the UFC wants to put you in the spotlight because again, when the bantamweight division gets that spotlight, you want to shine. That's what I think. A lot of people love what Cody Garbrandt did when he fought Thomas Almeida. He made an exciting fight. He made a main event. Made people talk about it. And I kind of feel like the same way with this fight. You and John Lineker are going to go out and throw down. There's no way this is not an exciting fight. I think that's why you guys are the main event. Yeah, it's one hundred percent the reason that it's going to be. Well, it should have. Should, it is a main event, and we should have this fight a long time ago. I'm glad people have started realizing that there are true potential of being headliners, spotlight, or top dogs, and not only that, front runners for the UFC. <laughs> that was way too loud. Yeah. So now <laughs> top runners for the UFC. <laughs> so now and my- making sure we are. Do- oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was like front runner for the UFC and and all of that, making sure that we can uh, hopefully in turn be making the uh, big bucks here yeah. soon. Yeah. Well, I think when you look at the guys who are in the bantamweight division, the people want to see the most. I mean, like I said, it's 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 you. It's it's John Lineker. It's it's Cody Garbrandt. And obviously, I give respect to the champion Dominic Cruz because he does a great job as champion. But you know, it feels like you are the guys people want to see the most. I think that's a testament to the work you put in. At, you know, each and every time you step inside the octagon. That's because they think about I'm cute with my little, with my smile, my child's antics. <laughs> they don't realize that a little midget like myself has some capabilities of being great. <laughs> and some serious knockout power, right? Of course. Now, the most important question, my last question, John. Now, you, you're going to go out to Portland, Oregon. You fight John Lineker. You get another big knockout. Have you planned the post-fight dance? Have you got that in your head, what the dance is going to be yet? Nah, it's whatever hat comes at the moment. I don't know what to do. I have to get excited. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta flow. You gotta go with the flow, right? Exactly. You can't just like be trying to pregame this ahead of time. Like you can't go into an open mic session and sit there and think you're gonna go actually into a rap battle and think you're gonna just start putting a uh, uh, spitting out the rhymes that you wrote down. That's not a freestyle. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well. John, I tell you what, buddy, this is a phenomenal fight. I love this main event. I love this fight, and uh, I'm glad you're getting the spotlight like you deserve, man. That first knockout was incredible. I'm sure this fight's going to be incredible, and I appreciate you taking the time, as always, to chat with me. Oh, no problem. I'm glad you called. I was like waiting for your phone call, trying to get dressed. I was like, huh, I don't know if he's calling me just yet. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know I'm never late. Now, come on. I'm never late. I know. <laughs> Just sometimes I forget. <laughs> I don't know if you're thinking if it's going to be my time, noon o'clock, noon, or your time, noon. Oh, I got you. I got you. Yeah, that, those time zones mess us up from time to time, but we got it good. We got it good this time. Yeah. <laughs> well, John, I appreciate it, buddy. Safe travels out to Portland, man. Best of luck in the fight, and I appreciate it as always. Oh, no problem. I thank you, and I, I can't wait to talk to you again. All right, Be excited about the next upcoming fight. I love it. I love it. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. All right, later, brother. All right, bye-bye. The Fight Society podcast is sponsored by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage approval process into the 21st century. Fast, powerful, and completely online, it has taken out all the complicated, time-consuming parts of applying for a mortgage out of the equation. Hate searching through stacks of old files and paperwork? With Rocket Mortgage, you can easily share your bank statements and pay stubs at the touch of a button, helping you get approved in minutes for a custom mortgage solution that's been tailored to your unique financial situation. Even better, with Rocket Mortgage, you can do all of this on your phone or tablet. It's quick, online process that you can manage from the convenience of your couch. If you're looking to refinance your mortgage or buy a home, check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash MMA. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. The fight card this weekend from Portland, I mean, listen, is it, is, it, is it as stacked as a lot of cards you would typically see? No, but there are still some really fun fights on here, especially when you look at the main and co-main events. John Dodson against John Lineker and Will Brooks against Alex Oliveira. Had a chance to talk to all four of these guys, actually, over the past week. And I really, really like both these fights. When you look at that main event between John Dodson and John Lineker, you were talking about two guys who hit very, very hard, one-punch knockout power. Um, and these guys could have very easily fought at fly. I mean, obviously, don't forget, you know, John Lineker was a flyweight, well, sort of, for most of his UFC career. And I know John Dodson, as you heard there, you know, wanted to fight him back then. 
You know, the key in this fight to me is John Dodson's speed. We all know John Dodson's one of the fastest guys in the world. He's very elusive. Now, you know, this is a five-round fight, and, and, and he got a little tired uh, in, in his fights with Demetrius Johnson once we got deep into the fourth and fifth rounds. The thing is, is that when he was that's when he was cutting a lot more weight, getting down to 125. I don't know that he'll have those problems at 135. Now, there are a lot of fighters at 135 who Dodson could struggle against just because of size, power, and, and reach. You know, a guy like Dominic Cruz, I mean, obviously the best bantamweight in the world, is going to be tough for anybody, but, you know, Dominic is a huge bantamweight. He's also got a ton of reach and the way he fights, it would be really hard for a guy like John Dodson to get inside and land his power punches. I don't think that's going to be the case against John Lineker because John Lineker is such an aggressive fighter. He comes after opponents and he tries to trap them in bad situations against the cage and just unload on them with a, with a series of punches. He did it to Michael McDonald, which was damn impressive. But I think John Dodson's speed and footwork to get out of those situations, to, to circle off the cage and don't go into Lineker's power hand, I think that will do very, very well for John Dodson. And John Dodson, you know, he has a, he has solid wrestling. He's very, very fast on his feet with his punches as well, not just defensively, but also offensively when he kind of gets in there, hits quick and moves out again. He's got incredible takedown defense. I just think over the course of five rounds, and I'm not sure this fight's going to make it five rounds, but when you get deep into the third, maybe even into the fourth, I think eventually John Dodson is going to be able to catch and, and finish John Lineker at some point during that fight. I, I love this fight because Lineker is such a powerhouse and he's such a such a bully. And I mean that as a compliment. He just really goes after it and, and really, really just tries to pressure and finish his opponents. But I think Dodson's ability to get out of the way will be a key to him winning this fight. I think John Dodson's going to make a big statement this weekend with a win. Co-main event, I really like this fight with Will Brooks and Alex Oliveira. They're, they're bringing Will Brooks, who, who, in my opinion, was a top 10 lightweight the day he stepped into the UFC. I mean, what he did in Bellator was incredible. I would have loved to have seen him fight Eddie Alvarez when they were both in Bellator. Obviously, Will Brooks you know, beat Michael Chandler, who I have just an incredible amount of respect for. I, I like Michael Chandler so much, and I think that guy is such an athlete, and, uh, and and I still think Michael Chandler is growing in his career, and I think he's going to get even better, but Will Brooks beat him twice. Will Brooks is very, very good. Now, he didn't have his best night at the office necessarily against Ross Pearson. I mean, he won. He definitely won. It just wasn't like a, a dominant one-sided performance, what you hope to see out of a guy this highly touted in his debut, but that being said, the UFC is a different animal. It is not Bellator. It is not walking out to the same crowd regardless. Uh, so, you know, he had a kind of an off night a little bit and he still won, which is the most important part. Uh, that being said, you know, he's got to go out here and have a dominant performance against Alex Oliveira because he doesn't want, you know, 29, 28 performances being the way he, he makes his way up the division. He wants to have a dominant performance against a guy who's outside the top 15. So that way he can get those matchups against the top 15 guys. I mean, if he wants to get in there with the Michael Johnsons and the Khabib Nurmagomedovs and the Edson Barbosas of the world, he's going to have to go out there and really show that he belongs in that top 15. Now, Will Brooks is ranked in the top 15 right now, but I think facing a guy like Alex Oliveira, who's very tough, good submissions, good stand-up. I think that's a fight where you have to go out there and really dominate, and I think he can. I think Will Brooks has the wrestling, he has the power, he has the speed, he has all the weapons to make this a one-sided fight, and I think Will Brooks will win this fight by decision. I think Alex Oliveira is tough enough to keep it close in moments, but I think over the course of three rounds, Will Brooks will take over. He is a championship-level fighter. He's gone five rounds before. He knows how to dig deep and, and, and gut out these wins, and I think this will be a little bit better of a performance for Will Brooks and what we saw against Ross Pearson just because stylistically I think Oliveira is more of a jiu-jitsu player and I think he'll be a little more willing to go to the ground with Will Brooks. It may backfire on him because Will is such a good wrestler and so good on top control, but I think ultimately Will Brooks wins this fight, whether it's 29-28 or 30-27, I don't know. I think he wins by decision. It may not be the statement he wants to make, but it's a statement enough that he's going to get into the next fight of his career in the UFC to where he can continue that climb. I would love to see a fight with Will Brooks and like Ally Quinta. That would be a fun fight. Will Brooks against the winner of Jim Miller and Tiago Alves. That would be a fun fight. Not putting him too deep into the top 15 just yet because lightweight is such a freaking snake pit, but it gets him out there against a little bit higher, a little bit better known name, which is the key. He's getting a spotlight this time with the co-main event. If he wins this, give him a fight that will get him a little higher, but don't push him into the deep end of the lightweight division just yet. Let him kind of ease 
squeeze his way in, and you give him a guy like a like a like a like a, like a, a Jim Miller, who's an ultra tough fighter, or a Joe Lozon, or, or or a Diego Sanchez, even somebody with some name value that doesn't necessarily put him in that top fifteen just yet. I think that would be a great matchup for Will Brooks if he gets through this weekend. The action all starts on FS1, 11 p.m. Eastern on Saturday night, four-fight main card. So the time sounds off, 11 p.m., but it's literally the same exact timing as a regular card that would start at 10 p.m. It's just starting an hour later, so there's only four fights. Um, want to say a big thank you, of course, to our guest today, Michael Bisping, the middleweight champ of the world. He takes on Dan Henderson next Saturday night at UFC 204. Also a big thank you, of course, to uh, John Dodson. He takes on John Lineker this Saturday night, 11 p.m., Fox Sports 1. Make sure you check that out next week we're going to welcome into the show Gegard Musasi is going to stop by still working on some more guests for next week so make sure you tune into that I want to say a big thanks to everyone that's been listening to the new podcast make sure you check us out on SoundCloud make sure you check us out on iTunes just search Fight Society follow me on Twitter at Damon Martin and we will see you guys in one week's time for more Fight Society thanks for tuning in we'll see you then